chapter fifteen of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma francis brook chapter fifteen it was one of d'auvernay's stock remarks that sheridan and his friends were the worst enemies anarchism had in england and it was obviously true the home office itself the police the racial instinct of the people against foreign theoretical importations were as nothing compared to the penetrating effect which a rapid spread amongst the working classes of sheridan's hopeful synthetic method produced on the anarchist cause it is those parliamentary socialists said the frenchman with bitter scorn who are our irreconcilable foes in england for they disarm the people's hate of the government by their programme of energetic reform to call any one a parliamentary socialist was in the mouth of an anarchist equivalent to naming him traitor to add that he was successful was to mark him as an adroit self-seeker and schemer the theory of the anarchist demanded a clean erasure and he who occupied himself with merely modifying and improving a present system set himself in these uncompromising eyes on the side of the oppressor against the oppressed a croise l'infâme everything is at an end those were the capital notes of d'auvernay's creed but sheridan was already a success and his ideas were already in the swing of actuality it appeared to himself simply to have happened so because events had continued to go as he had perceived that they were going the genius of sheridan lay in his accurate prevision of the trend of circumstance and in the swiftest possible instinct after the feel of things it was simply owing to his possessing a mind imbued and dyed with the intrinsic humour of his age that he touched public affairs with such an inspiration of common sense though to men who were more abroad than he was this speed and accuracy were inexplicable to a section his rapid and faithful building his power of synthesis was voted mere adroitness to a vulgar type it became interested scheming sheridan his teeth set as it were to the heart of the day and every nerve athrill with the hunt scarcely paused to consider the effect of his own personality on the various judgments of others he took the good and the bad the praise and the blame as it came and never lost his head in the issue a strong and wholesome streak of humility saved him from too exalted an estimate of his own importance and preserved certain valuable characteristics that kept him the affection of his friends scarcely a man was ever so faithfully beloved of his immediate associates and that in a circle noted for a firm loyalty in friendship lucilla herself in her moments of darkest uneasiness was acutely conscious of the claims of an extremely strong friendship the point of anguish in her growing intellectual apostasy being its complication with this feeling of personal allegiance unfortunately the need for a striking martyrology was strong with her and nothing was less like a martyr than sheridan's bearing of joyous militancy success of any sort in the present condition of society was banned in her eyes as an evil thing particularly a success dealing with established and legal means for was not such success a mere new manifestation of authority a change in the picture might be taking place but the old frame rimmed it the frame which had rimmed every possible iniquity under the sun after the scene in the park lucilla silently dropped all intercourse and active work with sheridan and his circle of the socialist party 
that incident marked for her the termination of an exceedingly happy half-year of life full of freshly springing flowers of friendship and association an arid wind of doubt and distrust had destroyed it and once more she was in revolt d'auvernay and his friends now became constant companions of her leisure moments and such time as she could spare from the scrupulous performance of her duties was devoted to the study of anarchism of anarchism that is of the ultra foreign type d'auvernay was a man of passionate sincerity indeed he had undergone suffering and imprisonment for his cause this went a long way with any one as apt to interpret sincerity in terms of martyrdom as lucilla was he was of course delighted with his convert finding it a very interesting and soothing task to expound his doctrines to this clear sensitive nature the soul-moving delicacy of the small face the girl's face with its large seriousness of lips and brows lent an additional thrill to a dogma that is always emotional and the fire of responsiveness in her dreaming eyes when he called on her to revolt invariably kindled new ardours in his own the situation was critical and dangerous it was a tinder spark of wildest and most explosive nature upon which the foreigner breathed in the heart of a girl whose english training left her curiously ignorant though delicately free and whose courage and power of self-devotion far outstripped both her physical strength and her intellectual capacity of resistance with all this the personal attraction of d'auvernay for lucilla was small in her absorption with his ideas she seemed to pass him over and looking on to the vision beyond him miss a sensible perception of the man who conveyed it it was his theory not him at which she gazed and even this was dimly seen though gloriously and as through a mist for a veil as it were of the older habit of thought and instruction fell over the vision just when she thought that she might penetrate to the end and catch the clear outline of meaning to the full satisfaction of her soul and intellect again always the complete glow of her heart's adhesion was hindered by that wandering and reproachful reminiscence of paul and his influence which would cut across the impulse in the very moment of final self-surrender and arrest it so far indeed lucilla had only trembled on the brink d'auvernay liked best to instruct her through the records of his own history i have been in revolt he said to her ever since i was a child at school and my heart was first fired by being witness of the injustice of a master to a schoolfellow the injustice even when discovered was not atoned for it was passed over in order that authority might be upheld from that hour i began to question what was this authority and what use did it answer i found that everywhere when examined into it answered only the uses of injustice and oppression its more harmless manifestations aimed at least at curtailing and hindering spontaneity at cutting off the way between natural impulse and action what even apart from those crying instances where authority is elevated into a system is the good of a series of formulas and rules mademoiselle i protest i have never once in my life arrived at handling a real living truth but that i have smashed some accepted convention on the head beforehand you see he said our obedience to conventionality forces us into cruelty in the most primitive parts of our existence the doctors have laid down certain laws about our primitive appetite for food and in our obedience to a conventional idea we think we are justified in paying our butchers for unspeakable atrocities the lamb led to the slaughter-house is not the worst of these yet formerly innocent creatures were sacrificed to just some such conventional notion about acceptable religion 
the jewish god being represented by priestly authority as a fiend snuffing up blood with his nostrils all that until the prophets revolted against the priests religion has everywhere in every country taken on the form of demanding from the individual sacrifice and again sacrifice and sacrifice from age to age government has meant to the masses of the people authoritative wickedness and legal injustice and throughout human history all this cowardly oppression of spirit and of body has figured mademoiselle as necessary order but mark you you will find invariably that the next age sick at the result has risen in rebellion against the necessary and has broken it up do you not see mademoiselle that it is impossible for you to seek or to find your own true individuality until you have broken up and rescued yourself from all formulas in the same way an oppressed people can only rescue themselves by a final and complete revolt and you whose compassionate heart cannot endure to take part in a society and a government whose very existence implies a languishing host of the outcast and condemned you mademoiselle will throw in your lot with the revolting and oppressed people you will join in crushing infamy it is the only remedy this was very different from paul's talk it was extremely inspiring strictly logical and rounded off to so plain and comprehensive a finish that it commended itself to a perplexed soul out of its mere simplicity now paul if she had met and spoken to him would have been sure to have attempted to allay her turbulent thinking by something excruciatingly practical and irrelevant lucilla this physician of the sick would have remarked have you any time to spare to help us the county council elections are going to be fought hard she could see in imagination the rapid decision in speech and gesture the prompt extinction of high-flying emotions under the sheer impetus of a strong mind alert for the next common-sense duty but to d'auvernay the very conception of a council even though conducted by progressive archangels would have sufficed to turn him blue the quality of the authority hardly made a change in his main position what more right has an angel to command me than a devil he would have said there was no fierceness in d'auvernay's appearance he had an extremely gentle and habitually considerate manner and the expression of his countenance was mild and inviting he had none of paul's rapid decisiveness nor of littleton's brusqueness neither of these men came near to adopting such a fascinating courtesy of demeanour as d'auvernay's the truth is it was more than courtesy it was a genuine deference to the individuality in another to the precious gift of the ego everywhere breathing in his habitual bearing do as you will was the final note of d'auvernay's dogma and his slightest gesture was an encouragement to the enterprise in others in truth it is magnificent advice with a splendour of impossibility within it the apprehension of its profound reach and profounder difficulty does not exactly lie on the surface of so simple a phrase but let those who call this comprehensive instruction mere claptrap try to put it into practice for even so short a period as a single day for the rest d'auvernay was a tall man of handsome features and colouring his face did not possess quite the chiselled regularity of a handsome englishman there was a slightly exaggerated arch in the nose and the carving of the nostrils and jaw wanted perfect finish but the outline more than passed muster and his dark soft eyes were splendid with free and well-marked brows above them then he possessed a fine moustache and a clear olive-tinted skin his carriage was not defiant but of a gentle resolute dignity as of one conscious of no spot on earth worth so much as the one his own foot pressed his smile was beautiful and it was accompanied by a pleasant glimmer of perfect teeth 
to a surface psychologist it may appear a marvel that so fine a personality with the moment all his own should have obtained no greater empire over an ignorant young girl like lucilla than was the case it being necessary to her nature to cast the halo of her illusions over some one head she selected for the purpose louise michel the picture of that strong-souled woman leading the insurgents to les invalides with a black flag as banner haunted her it was certainly an incident to catch a young girl's fancy that she thought was surely an historic moment such an act seemed almost commensurate with the burning ardour and capacity for devotion which she felt within herself and which she considered the proper normal condition of the socialist's heart she would spend hours in her lonely flat poring over louise michel's writings and those of kindred anarchists her hot cheeks resting on her small white hands and her eyes feverishly searching from page to page of the foreign tongue for some confirmatory sentence which should throw the vague premonitions of her heart into distinctness and outline and bring her intellectual inquiry to some delicious full stop of assurance the strange thing was that she never found it nothing ever stood out to her so clearly that she could feel she had given it full mental acquiescence there were meteoric flashes of light but they were lost as soon as conceived and her mental condition passed again into nothing more distinct than a nebulous confused emotion gradually a chill followed on the first glow this abortive intellectual search was dogged by fears and presentiments and a sense of being alone then came a dull and habitual ache of the heart at lost companionship it was something that rose with her in the morning and lay down with her at night it had not the power to influence or shake her for of what worth is the companionship of the body when souls are apart but natural feeling had its way sometimes she would leave her book suddenly casting away with a sense of disgust the very ideas that had enthralled her a moment before and pacing up and down her lonely chamber would conjure up to her fancy vivid presentments of her socialist friends to these she would talk silently from the mind long conversations they were full of entreaty argument meek self-confession passionate upbraiding promises and return finally she would pause before sheridan's portrait at this she would gaze long and fixedly her hands loosely clasped her figure in its simple clinging gown the very exponent of strength in slightness posed gracefully and motionless thus she would stand and looking at the portrait she would fancy it became indeed an invariable idea connected with it that from the silent picture some influence of reproach and recall came out towards her but paul she would say gently in an effort at a poor and hungry consolation i have not left you and the others yet i am only trying and testing to see where the truth lies i daren't come back till i am sure of myself when i do come back i shall find that you also have got hold of more truth there won't be such chasms between us after this i am sure it is the same road we are on one day one day it will all be as before thus she went on holding herself apart from the old comradeship until the summer term had run out and the summer vacation was drawing to an end flying with rash determined feet down one path and dreaming that the old companions stood still even in moments that they followed and then one day the inevitable occurred circumstance informed her that as she had moved so had her companions moved also down ways of their own end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org
transition by emma francis brook chapter sixteen in a broad street of east london stood a small empty shop it consisted of two rooms an outer and an inner the street was a typical one a main channel for the flow of busy anxious life a constant stream of persons pressing westward jostled a constant multitude of passengers pushing in the opposite direction each separate pair of feet each separate heart beating on in an urgent individual effort to shake out of the massed indifference of things some little turn in his own favour two lines of tramways conveyed cars full of persons hither and thither on the same feverish errand at different points in the road stations had been built as exits from railways leading to different points of the compass to and from which shrieking engines conveyed passengers in the same wild hurry-scurry of endeavour the cataract of sound which filled the air the roar of steam and wheel traffic of feet that came and went of voices that cried aloud and spared not testified to the tremendous pressure of modern life in the individualistic struggle within the district if you pursued the street westward you came to rows of tolerably good houses always interspersed with shops where second-rate goods or even third-rate were displayed the houses were those wherein respectable dullness struggles to maintain gentility by the process of curtailing real life if you pursued it eastwards you came to a more densely populated district and to houses from which gentility shrinks but here on the whole the atmosphere was slightly more jovial the depth being reached the fear of toppling over was at least subtracted and with it the dread of detection domestic comedies and tragedies overflowed into the streets and produced for the casual loafer impromptu spectacles and a chance of snatching from such glorious insouciance a brief interest or mirth if you followed some of the streets southwards you came to abodes of the unfashionable rich having escaped both gentility and poverty here you were privileged to breathe the air of conventionality mediocrity rigidity and repletion if from the main street you threaded the ways northwards you came to houses of a smaller and more grinding gentility to sorrowful rows of the doldrums the sight of which prostrated the courage and again to even more congested districts than before where the rollicking drama of the poor shrieked from the windows and tumbled into the road then there was the river that was invisible to the casual visitor so preoccupied were the banks with wharves and warehouses that they could only be reached if a passport of business a hammer or an invoice or something of that nature was carried in the hand the strolling passenger was excluded but there nevertheless was the river if it was not to be seen it was to be surmised by the feel of the life that clusters about it by the feel of the flow of it the dark beautiful stealthy flow the burdens upon it borne buoyantly heavy barges boats stealing here and there sullen steamers and the shores black with mud and stained and torn with the deep track of human effort by the dream of the look of the buildings on the sides tossed up without design or symmetry but charged by mere proximity with a touch of romance from that memorial flow between in this district over the empty shop in the main street paul sheridan had displayed his name and the shop itself he had turned into his committee rooms lucilla knew nothing about the matter it was an incident of which all the world was talking but the cloistral habit into which either circumstance forced her or which 
she voluntarily adopted toward some of the concerns of life excluded her from the common knowledge she habitually skipped election intelligence in the papers no woman desired a vote less or despised election matters more but in the world it was everyday talk that an important parliamentary vacancy having occurred in this particular metropolitan district the seat was being contested at the by-election not by two candidates as is the received order in a world supposed to be divided into two patriotic parties but by three the candidates being mr tootle conservative mr boodle gladstonian liberal and mr paul sheridan socialist it was the introduction of the third man that made the occasion exceptional the political situation was indeed of an interesting and delicate nature the ordinary assumption is that the lucky penny must always be in the right hand or in the left now mr tootle the accepted conservative candidate stood for the right hand and mr boodle conventional liberal stood for the left so far the clan tootle had carried the seat uncontested in the conservative interest from time immemorial and as a wealthy family which punctually collected rents from the large districts of slums in the neighbourhood who could have a better right to represent the inhabitants of those slums in parliament than the present owner of them but at the last general election after careful calculation it was considered in liberal quarters that a very fair chance of wresting the seat from the conservatives had arrived and the liberal caucus having put their heads together in deliberation mr boodle was accepted as a promising candidate in addition to mr boodle's being an ardent worshipper of mr gladstone and an impassioned home ruler he had vested local interests in the neighbourhood in the form of immense business connections and a big clientele of employés what more fitting than that mr boodle should represent in parliament the large number of persons to whom he habitually paid wages on the handsome scale of five pence an hour that had been the situation at the last general election mr boodle had failed but the conservative majority was so narrow that the wisdom of a liberal attack upon the seat was considered proven upon a vacancy occurring now a representative of the clan tootle immediately presented himself and was duly accepted by his party the expectant mr boodle also again came promptly forward here however a hitch occurred things had gone forward since the general election the socialist spur had pushed on the liberal horse and waked up the liberal intelligence one degree so that in liberal quarters mr boodle who consistently stood on his foregone conclusions was shyly glanced at as possibly not the man for the moment likely to enhance the liberal cause of course the official liberal fervently wished that things were ambling on as slowly and comfortably as before and that such a man as mr boodle was the square man for the square whole but there was no use any longer in concealing the fact that he was not if the seat was to be successfully contested it was plain that a stronger man with straighter knees and with a habit of hitting out from the shoulder was wanted to do it moreover in the locality itself mr boodle was by no means received with flattering rapture at the moment when the liberal officials were thus perplexed between facts as they were and facts as they wished them to be and while they were looking round anxiously for a safe man who would appear sufficiently spirited while never breaking the check of the liberal chain mr paul sheridan stepped quietly to the front 
and announced his intention of contesting the seat upon the invitation of the trades council the socialist organizations the radical clubs of the place the local trade unions and in short of every really advanced progressive of the district the announcement at the best could but be a very mixed joy to the official liberals it was impossible not to acknowledge that sheridan who was everywhere recognized as one of the ablest and most rising men in london was eminently fitted for the task he had undertaken but it was also impossible even to the liberal imagination to screw sheridan down to the dimensions of an official liberal programme he was a man look at him how you would who insisted upon using his abilities in his own way and not according to lead and pattern certainly he was sound enough on home rule he would vote straight enough there but for the rest his career was lurid and meteoric to the liberal eye and who could definitely say what were the contents of the tale to this comet the liberal officials took refuge in neutrality paul who knew very well that he could afford to dispense with their open patronage and who very much preferred being without it took the least possible notice of these conscientious doubters he had seen his opportunity and had gone forward at it with his usual energetic swing and he was now taking vigorous pains to bring the matter through without stopping to guess whether the fruition would fall to him or not to the clan tootle it was almost as though he had intruded himself into a family party and was insisting upon taking the head of the table while by mr bootle who had naturally declined to withdraw and by his cherished adherents mr sheridan was regarded as not only a mischievous and unpatriotic political adventurer but as a political absurdity you can't do it you know said mr bootle in general reference to mr sheridan's ideas it's impossible besides which it's iniquitous in the constituency for the first time within the memory of man however the introduction of the personality of sheridan into the election awakened a deep movement of interest this was pre-eminently the case amongst the large working population whose lethargy hitherto had been the despair of mr bootle the situation was interesting and novel enough and excited sufficient attention to draw a cartoon from punch to itself the leading picture of the week represented two large and ancient house dogs labelled respectively conservative and liberal looking down in majestic astonishment and contempt at a third little dog who with truculent tail stiffly upraised furiously barked in the centre the cartoon was entitled the rise of the third party meanwhile as the talk went on sheridan prepared for the fight the empty shop in the main street suddenly became a scene of busy life and broke out on the exterior into an efflorescence of inscriptions and anything that could catch the eye and convey it to a point whereon the name of sheridan was blazoned sheridan's colour was red and throughout the district was a pleasing dash of that staunch hue distributed on street boardings and bare walls the placards briefly recommended the populace to vote for sheridan also in the windows were portraits of himself done on cards in a red smudge representing a fine head and striking profile sheridan walking down any street might encounter evidences of himself from any pane and at any corner on the other hand mr tootle's colour was blue and close upon sheridan's red dashed a blue smudge recommending the populace in prominent letters to vote for tootle then mr bootle's tint was yellow and close on the track of the blue and the red came a yellow admonition to vote for bootle 
the streets indeed became a silent tussle of competing colour which it was a joy to the passer-by to behold and which was incidentally a great enlivener of the constitutional dullness of the neighbourhood nor was sheridan's portrait permitted to look out from the windows in isolated impudence mr tootle condescended to display a roman nose and precipitous back head to the riff-raff of the place mr bootle following suit had his bald head and nougat fringe elaborated in black lines with yellow fixings some of the smaller and less reputable windows delighted at the unexpected possession of so much art displayed all three heads impartially in a row upon the panes then there were the programmes it was these brief breathings of aspiration which caused the boardings and bare stones of the districts to start suddenly into political gabble every archway and silent corner dangled a promise like pious jews with their phylacteries the houses bound the utterances of mr sheridan mr tootle and mr bootle about their foreheads and upon the skirtings of the roads mr tootle's and mr bootle's programmes sometimes jostled each other inconveniently this was the fault of a simple old bill sticker named dan connolly who moved into the midst of the election fray like an antiquated child in the hope of turning an honest penny and offered his services to both candidates alike dan connolly knew nothing and cared nothing about elections he himself did not possess a vote his importance to the state had not risen to such a point as that all that he was aware of was that bills were required to be stuck and that suddenly his services were in unusual request it was indeed to him a golden opportunity in these days of universal schooling dan had cleverly avoided learning to read and was therefore incapable of perusing the programmes but he knew when the letters were right side up and he had a wonderfully accurate eye otherwise he distinguished between mr tootle and mr bootle simply by colour and the locality of the committee rooms dan connolly's code of morality began and ended in a rigid sense of honesty he knew of nothing more when therefore he found himself engaged on a bill-sticking job both by the blue gentleman and the yellow one he registered a vow in his simple old heart to deal fairly by both tootle should have his sixpenn'orth of bill sticking in the exact same measure as bootle and no more while the election controversy raged around and passions rose and words flew one heart stood quiet singly and alone the heart was that of the bill sticker he kept his eye single indeed his sole preoccupation being his bills to lay them straight to stick them fast and above all to give each colour it's due in off hours when he was not sticking them on he prowled round with just pride in his work to admire it and to watch over it it was a shock to him to discover that for some unknown reason malicious persons had a spite against his bills every now and then he found his handiwork destroyed once he came across a group of men tearing down a yellow placard before the paste was dry the sight threw him into an extreme agitation the rending of the new and beautiful bill pierced his heart even to tears it happened again and again each time that it happened he hurried to the committee rooms and burst in upon the agent with a plaintive and tremulous cry sir he would exclaim they are tearing down my bills my bills sir they are tearing them down dan's equitable disposition in regard to his employers bore a fruit too obvious however to be to the mind of either it is not always rigid justice that we desire in others treatment of ourselves neither is the motive by any means always a measure of the effect one morning after an extreme early activity on the part of the bill sticker in the main road an extraordinary effect met the eyes of mr bootle as he stepped from the train 
he perceived his own yellow programme hanging before him with the stultifying blue promises of mr tootle neatly attached in twin-like amity to its side going on further he remarked another of his placards jocosely poking mr tootle's as it were in the ribs in fact wherever he turned he perceived the same phenomenon his own programme friendlily winking the eye and shaking hands with that of his rival vote for boodle liberal candidate home rule for ireland peasant proprietorship reform of land laws shorter hours for miners non-aggressive foreign policy social and industrial reform leasehold enfranchisement better housing of the poor vote for boodle and healthy homes happy hearts better living brighter lives vote for tootle conservative candidate one queen one parliament small holdings and allotments easy transfer of landed property shorter working day for railway arbitration rather than war men promotion of home trade reduction of income tax reform of poor law administration vote for tootle and reduced taxation unbroken peace untarnished honour social reform the first pair of amicable bills with their beautiful yellow and blue effect merely irritated mr boodle the second pair startled him the third frightened him the fourth brought home to him a painful conviction the fifth threw him into a fury and sent him in a purple condition of rage at a pace quite inconsistent with dignity on a warm august morning along the street in the direction of his committee rooms whence five minutes afterwards issued his agent pale in a hurry and with murder in his eye it happened that morning that littleton came into the district to assist sheridan in his work and the sight of the blue and yellow programme startled him into the belief that mr tootle and mr boodle had made open cause against their common foe pausing under one pair of placards he found himself in company with two coal porters and a dock labourer there they stood with their heavy patient figures motionless their tools shouldered their trousers hitched up with string the slow and shrewd faces being deeply and silently intent upon the bills which presumably they read from beginning to end without missing a syllable after the long staring silence they turned stolidly away not a dam to choose atwixt em as i can see bill not a dam sheridan's task was to persuade different portions of the constituency into supporting as much of the collectivist idea as had so far been worked into practical legislative proposals the voice that spoke in the hall near the riverside had to be a different one from the voice that spoke to the select gatherings in the rich quarter of the south also he had to attune himself to different congregations as well as to different classes for the hue of the religion passes into the political conviction it was every variety and specimen of heart and head which he had got to catch by his idea for sheridan stood for an idea to prevent the least doubt and mistake about it he had published beforehand a small book entitled the parliamentary programme of social reform this bound in a red cover was sold at a trifling sum from his office now mr tootle and mr boodle had not hedged their political conscience round with a printed book they were too wise to venture on such a record and when they discovered that the aspiration of job as to his enemy was fulfilled in their instance both alike rejoiced it furnished occasion to both when upon the platform they were gravelled for lack of matter and out from the pocket of either conservative or liberal candidate would whip the pernicious red flag as it was popularly called of the firebrand sheridan and marked passages of an uncompromising nature would be perused in agitated tones to an audience who listened with bated breath 
mr tootle had discovered that it was impractical nowadays to attempt to hold the attention of an audience on the union alone particularly in that district it became a somewhat somnolent gathering after half an hour's twittering on the subject and it was imperatively necessary to add other matter rally round lord salisbury's banner he cried to the jaded open-mouthed faces that stared stolidly up to him i confidently claim your support for lord salisbury's government in my person has it not upheld a firm foreign policy and thereby made employment more general and more profitable it has cheapened the necessaries of life and has promoted legislation that tends to improve the conditions under which the working classes have to live and labour if lord salisbury's government remains in office there is every assurance that a bill for the restriction and regulation of alien immigration will be brought in and passed lord salisbury has his eye upon this source of straitened circumstance it is a manifest injustice that the alien pauper the foreign jew should be landed in shoals upon our shores and should overrun the field of employment it is a manifest injustice and crescendo the conservative rulers of this land will not permit it uproar voice of huge docker excitedly i say old chappie we ain't got no manner of grudge agin them little furrin devils it warn't no jews as tried to steal the docker's tanner from him and it warn't no jews as come and tried to play blackleg i'm not afeard of a furrin jew not i let him come and welcome cheers mr bootle apprehensive that a perpetual seesaw on home rule was beginning to have a soporific tendency even when interspersed with music and a hymn in praise of mr gladstone struggled hard to introduce new matter into his speeches without suggesting anything so dangerously self-committing as genuine reform his task of looking progressive whilst shunning progress was indeed a slippery one a moment after promising a general alleviation of conditions he would stumble on a particular admonition to thrift while impressing upon his audience the necessity of the awakening of labour to its electoral duties he fell into an admission that he was totally opposed to payment of members and close upon glorifying the dignity and greatness of the liberal party he inadvertently mentioned that he was in favour of only just that niggard measure of reform as was necessary to bring his side again into office finally he would beat a retreat into safe and meaningless generalities and drop breathless to the haven of home rule if you honour me with your confidence he explained i will give my loyal support to all liberal measures which may be brought forward and if other constituencies will follow your example these liberal measures whatever they are will speedily be passed into law there is one matter which is at the moment engaging my serious intention and that is the importation of foreign cattle this is a practice which is stealing upon us unobserved for the most part but yet upon which a vigilant eye is fixed you are throwing gentlemen meat and hides upon a market already overstocked and the result is to eat up our profits to eat up our profits gentlemen now let me touch for a moment upon a very alarming topic we have in our midst unscrupulous agitators who try to lead away the people with vain imaginings and pernicious doctrine let me tell you gentlemen that iniquitous proposals against the rights of capital simply result in driving capital out of the country while rashly to extend as proposed the provisions of the factory acts is merely to eat up the narrow subsistence of the poor widow and to sacrifice this object of our universal commiseration to the ambition of vain schemers in conclusion i give you i repeat my promise of a general support to the liberal programme and to our great leader mr gladstone whose magnificent object is to make ireland permanently contented and loyal to audiences languishing under oratory such as the above the resource of abusing the firebrand sheridan and the protection of the red flag of revolution from the pocket was invariably productive of an agreeable sensation why said sheridan to his agent when he heard of the practice his eyes shining and his whole face laughing of course this accounts for the large number of persons who have called at the office lately to buy the book the book had twelve chapters each one expounding twelve heads of sheridan's programme in sheridan's clear-witted style 
the rage it excited testified to its freshness and force to further the propaganda of his idea he had twelve leaflets which were in effect short abstracts of the twelve chapters printed for free distribution the twelve heads of his programme were home rule for london payment of members and election expenses and adult suffrage triennial parliaments a legal eight hours day a graduated income tax and death duties untaxed breakfast table universal old age pensions union wages in government departments public control of secondary schools taxation of ground values extension of the factory and sanitary acts municipal ownership of urban soil and public administration of all monopolies land mines railways etc etc the leaflets were distributed broadcast together with sheridan's portrait and election card by friendly comrades who came into the district to assist in the cause while not neglecting the rich and genteel quarters the comrades especially haunted congested places and stirred up the workers to their opportunity the iniquity of it when it came to his own particular clientele caused mr bootle to stamp round his committee-room in agitation what business have these people in the district at all i wish to inquire he put it to his sympathising agent there are trucks full of em sir replied the latter i see em every day canvassin work and rootin up and down and givin away piles of leaflets where on earth he gets his friends from i can't say sir he's in the tory pay cried mr bootle who did not in the least believe his own words depend upon it smithers he's in the tory pay this sort of thing costs money well sir we must pluck up heart he hasn't given away the seat to the conservative party yet mr tootle's agent was at a similar loss i should like to mention sir that we must rub up our forces a bit the socialist candidate is showing a good deal of resource i've never called at a single house yet but that mr sheridan hasn't been before me and his red envelope didn't fly at me from the doorstep i meet them walking in every street with a pile of papers under their arms especially females sir especially females mr tootle extended his eyeglass judicially and accentuated his remarks by moving it up and down i am wholly against the interference of women in these masculine transactions home mr topkinson is the place for woman at the same time we might endeavour to requisition the aid of some of the primrose dames from another point of view we must remember that mr sheridan's activity is in our favour as against mr bootle certainly sir paul knew how to keep his office in order and to prevent waste both of time and energy he placed one or two competent persons at the head of affairs and gave them clear directions as to what had to be done then he flung himself with fine trust on the devotion of his friends on his own energy and above all on the freshness and vitality of his programme one evening in company with littleton and his agent he set out for the hall near the riverside where he expected to address an audience of working men the narrow street where the hall was situated was crowded with folk on the alert for a taste of excitement a thrill from a greater life enlivened the strict monotony of daily existence a momentary sense of participation with high matters this stir in the air quickened the depressed spirit and sluggish blood to something beyond itself moreover it was the turn for the populace to catechise the boss on such occasions as these it was permissible and safe to permit the critical humours to overflow irreverently towards the higher orders again a row royal was possible and even probable the street gay with flecks of light from open shop doors and windows and full of groups of talkers was a great occasion for the loosing of tongues in argument unusual mirth broke the air up in circles of chat and laughter it was a parliament of the pavement wherein the respective merits of gladstone and salisbury were freely enough handled and the law on every conceivable topic irresponsibly but often very shrewdly laid down 
it gave a particular zest to the occasion to know that the election was being anxiously watched gladstone and salisbury as it were touting for each individual vote that added spice to existence to taste even for one moment the value of one's own power of choice what about this chap sheridan that's a rattlin good programme of his well we wanted livening up to my mind it'll put boodle's nose a bit out of joint in my opinion it's more quantity than quality with boodle well come on mates let's get in at the back and hear what paul's got to say for himself oh we've all heard paul one time or another they've got it out of the bible or somewhere that the love of money is the root of all evil but paul's one of them as knows that the want of it is the whole bloomin tree there's a lot in that i'm of his mind boodle's fellows are coming down to hoot him they say well boodle's got the root in him if he ain't got nothing else i'll come on and back paul for one i'm ready enough to lend uh and at chucking boodle i was at tootle's last night it's best to ear all sides lor ye never ear such a thing he done know where ye are don't tootle he rambled till folks were three parts mad bloomin old chap you'll never get to the end unless we stirs him up says a bloke to me and then he done it he up and shouted i say old gentleman when's the balloon goin hup oh gentlemen he says when's the balloon goin hup sheridan at the moment was detained in the road in conversation with a couple of labour leaders who had come down to speak for him the roll of a hansom along the street caused him to hurry forward that was a member of parliament who was anxious to avoid the return of mr boodle and who was to take the chair on the occasion when paul stepped on to the platform and faced that great audience of genuine workers of dock labourers stevedores watermen engineers firemen and sailors navies coal porters and all the kindred trades that audience of marred and patient faces as of men inured to endurance in the great struggle and toil of the worker's life a deep emotion rose within him he looked at them straight with his eyes from the soul and something seemed to snatch at the hearts of them for they gave a great shout and clapping of hands and a ringing cheer he stood to them for hope he and his idea it was easy for sheridan to address an audience like this for he was attuned with them in every fibre of his being long ago he had recognised that great need and sorrow and patient long deferred expectation as his work in life and he had never forgotten he stood for it now and he knew it the next evening was not so easy a dissenting minister with a heart wavering between boodle and paul had consented to lend the lecture-room attached to his chapel for a meeting and further had promised to preside in person the audience was small chill select littleton occupied a front row in isolation when paul appeared on the platform he was preceded and followed by a row of eminently serious persons who represented the deacons of the church and the proceedings to the extreme alarm both of the candidate and his friend were opened by prayer that went far towards dashing the resources of paul his humour and modesty were alike tickled at this over solemnity at his pretensions it was enough to have stolen the whip from his tongue and to have frustrated his eloquence but he found himself again and fought through the distasteful moment on an admirable and well-planned speech dealing with facts and statistics for the life of me said paul when he and littleton had escaped from the solemn atmosphere and were tasting the relief of laughter i could think of nothing that would follow appropriately on prayer except figures next evening it was again an audience of well-to-do persons in the rich district that were to be addressed paul professed himself plunged in despondency beforehand i've reached my highest scream already said he to littleton and i'm not at all sure that there's anything further to come the platform was to be filled with well-known metropolitan gentlemen who had taken up sheridan's cause partly in genuine sympathy with him and with the need of the district partly because they had but a limited intelligence of the scope of his idea 
sheridan's printed programme was suspected by one or two wary and perspicacious souls to be a mere thin edge of a wedge the occasion was not one for enthusiasm but for an illuminated reasonableness if such might be come at and the result though paul had expressed himself exhausted and run out beforehand was a display of native sagacity which if it did not win wholesale converts to his idea at least impressed every one with the conviction that here was a man who possessed a genuine programme and who could be relied on to push it nothing is so strong so effective as a man who can keep his idea intact and yet knows how to draw men's hearts with the right cords towards it we must take the town hall for a man like that said a leading citizen as the audience trooped out we must not waste such a speaker on small audiences i am not prepared to say whether i agree with him or not but he ought to be heard he is a profound and very sincere thinker and a very fine head too a very fine head sheridan and littleton drove to the station tired out evening after evening shall we win have we a chance was littleton's constant inquiry i don't know whether i shall win now but i haven't a shadow of doubt that the collectivist idea is winning all along the line was sheridan's reply the grand meeting at the town hall in his favour was eventually arranged and was successfully carried out the place being three parts full of that rougher audience whose presence warmed sheridan's heart and loosened his tongue that was the final occasion of his oratorical efforts these occasions were not altogether to the taste of paul the toil of committee work the necessary dry labour of the collection and tabulation of facts were more satisfactory to him he regarded necessary speech-making as a useful opportunity for the spread of the collectivist idea but it was more to his mind to be laboriously working out some one detail of that idea for with all his deep invincible faith in collectivism as conveying within itself the only realizable hope for the race and with all his swiftness in perceiving the next near phase which social progress was likely to put on he had no clear feeling of prevision as to the ultimate form that progress might assume on the contrary his heart was often overweighted with a sense of blindness in the face of the enormous complexity of the social problem the more he worked at reform the more inadequate did the sum of knowledge of the social structure seem to him and sometimes his passionate yearning was rather to know than to act failing such infallible knowledge he considered the yearning as something to be subdued to the main duty of activity in helping the general need by what ready light existed but it left him with an inclination towards hard dry toil over detail than towards impassioned speech-making and when he made his speech it turned as much as possible on facts few took so conscious a measure both of the work and of the limitation of human capacity in reforming society as did sheridan at the little office in the main street during the last days the work went fast and furious not only comrades but people of the district streamed in to offer their services pens and ink ran out blotting paper became scarce cases of paper envelopes and cards were emptied as soon as delivered and the indefatigable canvassers directed from the office pervaded every corner of the district on the polling day each one knew what his job was and each one set his teeth into it and held on mirth good humour and to spare prevailed but there was no confusion in and out of the place men came and went came and went messengers issued from it bound on definite errands and messengers returned with them fulfilled to take up the next meanwhile littleton had brought over a borrowed dog-cart and was driving sheridan the red colours attached to the turnout round the district on the track of sheridan boodle flashed in a yellow streak after him came tootle in blue and a carriage and pair taking off his hat and smiling at the family constituency by eventide the space in front of the little shop was constantly occupied by an approaching or departing carriage some one who had borne a batch of voters to the poll to record their votes 
was calling to receive new orders and would immediately roll off again on a fresh errand in the inner room the work of directing the messengers was fast and furious towards eight it flagged then everybody suddenly relaxed their efforts and drew breath sheridan was informed that not a voter remained on the carefully prepared lists who had not been looked after or carried to the poll littleton accompanied sheridan to the town hall to await the result mr bootle and mr tootle were there before him and neither turned round or took any notice when the socialist candidate entered the work of the scrutineers went on silently and fast within and the candidates waited in suspense in the open air a crowd was rapidly gathering a never-ceasing stream of people pressing on into the street towards eleven the road was impassable being filled by a closely packed concourse of persons at eleven a signal was given and a long low murmur of excitement and suspense thrilled over the crowd a tremor of sound accompanied by a rocking to and fro then from a window stepped out upon the balcony the returning officer closely followed by one of the candidates the other two appearing more slowly the result of the election was read out amidst the silence of the crowd sheridan two thousand nine hundred and ninety seven tootle two thousand eight hundred and sixty three bootle two thousand one hundred and forty five upon that rose from the rough throats of the riverside populace such a roar as had never rent the air of that district before it was a mighty sound of unanimous accord and gladness for sheridan the man of the people had won he stepped forward upon the balcony and stood there above the crowd for a moment his face pale an extraordinary surprise and emotion in his eyes his appearance was greeted by accelerated clamour the faces of the people flashed to him through the indistinct light rough animated every eye upon him every lip applauding and every horny hand uplifted with a cap his success was so brilliant so strange cannily fought for yet so unexpected his heart tightened and leaped in his breast and his breath came sharp through his teeth he stared at them silently for a moment then he steadied himself and found his voice he threw it towards the mass of men who had chosen him to represent them to those rough fellows who had found in him something that fitted themselves and he told them with brief restrained energy that he thanked them for their confidence that he understood the pledge he was under and that it was his heartfelt intention to fulfil it it was not easy for sheridan to escape whole in limb from the ardours of the crowd but littleton and other comrades had provided for the contingency of a rough demonstration being made in his favour and a cab was at hand into which he was hurried the driver being directed to go straight off to the station down the streets after him tore the hallooing crowd the roads viewed from the windows became as a wild phantasmagoria of hurrying figures a tumult of sound shook the air the night was full of cries and of the steps of a great populace running hither and thither in a storm of excitement so that sleepers awakened from rest rose elbow high to smile and listen as the name of sheridan leaped out on the darkness at each new wave of uproar arrived at the station breathless exhausted and laughing sheridan stepped from the cab and under guard from his friends ran for the covered steps to elude the attentions of his admirers as he made a dart forwards a mesmeric something drew his eyes in the direction away from the coming crowd he caught sight of a tall motionless figure standing in the centre of the pavement fancying that he recognised a friend he turned his joyous face full towards him he met from the eyes a cold and icy shaft of scorn and from the lips a bitter smile of derision and hate which even at that warm glad moment startled him then the man raised his hat and turned on his heel that was d'auvernay said paul to himself as he ran down the steps to judge from his appearance the anarchists are making small progress in england after all it was a hard blow both for tootle and for bootle and it was enough of a surprise to cause some talk in both conservative and liberal circles the lucky penny had not passed 
either to right or to left it was going away in the pocket of a third party after all the ruling of providence wrote mr bootle to mrs bootle next day has indeed been in this instance an inscrutable one you would learn from my telegram that the socialist sheridan is returned by a considerable majority over the heads of the more legitimate candidates undoubtedly had not this firebrand intervened the seat would have been won by me we must endeavour to establish ourselves upon a hope that this event may not prove calamitous to the country End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma frances brook chapter seventeen to sheridan's friends his brilliant success in his first electioneering campaign was a wild occasion of congratulation lucilla was the last to hear the news it was conveyed to her by the lips of d'auvernay and it fell as an overwhelming blow not till then had she realized how her heart had played with the false hope that sheridan would come over to the anarchist party and throw in his lot with the declared foes of society honora's attitude in face of the event was amusing that vigorously practical person was little troubled with disquieting ideals her ideal had vanished with charmides and she was now thoroughly satisfied with the commonplace work-a-day world of course said she when leslie threw his cap up in the air and informed her what had happened i am exceedingly glad to hear your news it seems to argue less revolution and more sanity in your proceedings the date of sheridan's election to parliament was the end of august but circumstances had so arranged it that both honora and lucilla were in town at the time it was now more than a year since honora had entered upon her duties as headmistress but during that time her school and her work had prospered exceedingly from the moment in which she had under lucilla's influence thrown aside the shackles of the crude and fastidious notions which had been the furnishing she brought home from the university humanness of the type consistent with the rest of her character developed she was adored by her pupils her capacity for helpfulness was rather genial and kind than tender but it was eminently to the point the truth was so capable had she proved in her administration of affairs that already the pleasant messenger of promotion had reached her and the reason of her own and lucilla's early return to town was that they were both making preparations for a move to a much larger and more important school to which honora had been appointed headmistress margaret henderson was duly installed headmistress of the one she had left while lucilla was to be established as honora's first mistress in the new one honora had only been able to snatch the briefest holiday at the seaside before she returned to town to make necessary preparations lucilla looking very wan and overworked was with her the promotion and the wider scope of work were too deep a delight to honora for her to be able to feel tired or too much dashed by the early return she was in splendid health and all her best instincts of wholesome self-realization were satisfied lucilla's new appointment was of course honora's own doing the girl with her far more daring intellect and far more original character had never lost the fascination she had exercised over honora from the first but if honora's intellect was not so daring it was really 
more powerful than lucilla's she was no follower of any eccentric will-o'-the-wisp lucilla on her side never lost her dancing mockery of the more prosaic nature the two were friends with a difference and certain topics and certain portions of lucilla's life were closed between them concerning home and her father honora heard from time to time not only through a regular correspondence tender on his side gently respectful on hers but from leslie a tacit understanding existed that leslie was to furnish her with news and it is probable that the old man's life was better filled by these occasional visits from the sympathetic young man full as they were of encouragement congenial interest and the only news that was news to him than they would have been by the constant presence of an uncomprehending daughter leslie often surmised but seldom learned what modification of view honora was taking as regards that event for a long time he was unable to detect any alteration of her demeanour towards it any approach to a grasp of her father's meaning one day however she dropped a significant remark i seem to see said she timidly a coincidence of idea between my father and mr sheridan there is the same warmth of feeling as regards the oppressed or i might perhaps say the poor and unsuccessful the same unshaken conviction of some particular burden of duty laid upon them and both seem to have in their minds some great directing conception which holds the whole together and gives it consistency on my father's side it is the church on mr sheridan's the community one day early in september at the very beginning of the autumn term honora stood in the bow window of her pleasant sitting-room the new school was in one of the large london suburbs and the outlook from the window included some trees and even a stretch of something that once had been green and lustrous but which at the present moment looked brown and sodden and chill for it was a drippingly wet day and the pavement oozed with damp and streaks of mist clung in the air lucilla was with her she sat at a table with books and papers before her who would imagine that little more than a year ago i thought i was resigning every hope when i left home and came to london to a high school exclaimed honora looking out on the gloom with a sunny wholesomeness that overcame it ah it is a good thing a mark of wisdom to find one's element now i never have done so replied lucilla honora turned from the window and walked to the inner part of the room disclosing a face that was serious and concerned and yet you taught me that wisdom lucilla said she i'm afraid you hamper yourself by peculiar views she added knitting her brow as to that in london it is one's privilege to think what one likes no honora it is not what one thinks or even what one does it is what one is but began honora in eager partisanship of all sincere true beings just so returned lucilla dryly i never could be adroit with circumstance my natural veracity is inconvenient and circumstance is my haggard foe honora approached the table and caressingly touched her friend's hair lucilla appeared to shrink as one does who is too consciously in need of consolation then she rose pushed aside her work and went to a low stool by the fire she sat crouched down with her elbows on her knees and her chin in her hands honora she suddenly exclaimed when they said that curses come home to roost they said it wrong it is prayers not curses that come home to roost what prayers aspirations our maddening aspirations the man who had scales before his eyes was very happy honora 
he did not think so no poor wretch he sought healing after that no doubt he saw things only too plainly she stared fixedly at the flame honora stood doubtfully by the table her brown eyes softened by questioning sympathy she was at a loss to understand lucilla's mood as she had been on many an occasion during the last twelve months it was impossible not to note that the girl's gay mockery ran more and more into bitterness and that her dryness had changed to a passionate sadness there were evidences of failing strength the cheek was too thin the eyes too large the slight frame always slighter the blind man who asked for his sight was a fool she repeated stubbornly i do not think so returned honora they say it is quite possible that we are in a sense blind that we may have extra senses latent within us and that in process of time they may pass into activity imagine opening new doors of perceptiveness she shuddered honora with her solidly stately step walked to a chair on the other side of the fire and sat down i should be glad said she it would be new power some of us would always be ahead and training the others does that exhilarate you it would leave one with a greater burden of character imagine having more of that she laughed her teeth twinkling in the firelight between her lips but there was not much mirth in it of the many spectres she continued the worst is one's own character there is no hope of ridding yourself from it you are always hobnob with it it rises in the night to appall you to tell you exactly what it requires of you and precisely why you are predestined to failure it sits down by you in the lonely evenings it takes you by the arm and walks with you out of doors it is a ghastly companion it is just yourself said honora oh no it is not i can imagine my consciousness accompanied by quite a different set of qualities all training all self-discipline is the hope of this but it does not come true honora leaned forward and looked at her friend with a searching and kindly air there was something medicative in her eyes i find my work such a refuge such a safeguard when troubling thoughts like these come said she then she leaned back in the armchair, her hands folded on her knees and prepared to listen further just so said lucilla like the ostrich we hide our heads hoping the furies will not see where we are yet i never found a book so absorbing well said honora seeing that she paused that it could spoil the inward assurance i have that that i am predestined to quarrel with my friends dear lucilla you can avoid offences not in the least if you happen to be inconveniently voracious veracity need not be offensive you can think the truth you need not always say it lucilla laughed again into the coals in addition to my veracity is my inconveniently devoted heart there is no offender like that did you ever hear of the passionate pilgrim shakespeare's asked honora oh any one's she leaned her breast up till a thorn and there sung the dolefulst ditty or was that a nightingale whatever it was honora i am convinced that he or she had been telling their particular friend the truth oh by all means avoid that exclaimed honora lucilla's eyes once more laughed into the fire this time with real humour in them though her lips were grave honora how successful you are of course one is never wholly satisfied returned honora feeling that it would be indelicate to clap her hands any more in face of this evident discontent you are something very near it now 
you possess this school a fine opportunity for useful work and you have a large salary and you have friends i think you touch them lightly at any rate you keep them i see you sitting before me with a wise and amiable face your brown eyes kindly and patient and your large hands so very capable and i do not wonder that you keep your friends leslie for instance once i quarrelled with leslie said honora quickly the occasion the garden and the summer evening her own voice and leslie's came back to her vividly it was she added because he told me the truth when i come to think of it there you are returned lucilla now i know that he was right said the other and you have forgiven him you begin to bless him perhaps oh dear no said honora firmly ah that is right don't quarrel of course what is the use if you have friends keep them but avoid in particular loving them i don't think i am that kind of woman said honora dubiously we never know what kind we are until the plough turns up the soil but you have all sorts of chances don't throw them away what are my chances asked honora the personal turn in the conversation softened and agitated her lucilla seemed to be speaking out of some deep knowledge that endowed her like a new faculty and the sense of success dwindled in surmise your great chance is that you have got your foot well planted on the earth keep it there perhaps however the beauty of your case is that you have not got it in you to remove it lucilla's eyes sought her friends in half challenging mockery but still i warn you don't be a passionate pilgrim and listen too curiously for the thrills of life and the inner significance of things don't play too much a spiritual invisible drama don't in short be a seer and a poet if you can possibly help it it is killing work i've always thought you very poetical lucilla said honora gravely lucilla sprang suddenly to her feet with a light laugh and stretched herself with her arms thrown above her head guess what i'm going to do said she well what i'm going right back to town straight away to study all day at the british museum what a blessing these saturdays are oh lucilla i wanted to keep you for the weekend. impossible i'm off in an hour's time i shall be at my desk with my nose in a dictionary and a sad array of dry volumes by my side adieu oh won't you stay to lunch honora spoke with some anxiety lucilla merely shook her head and began in brisk activity to put away her papers and books and then to throw on her hat and cloak she had reached the door and seemed to be going suddenly she turned back looked at her friend with a long startled gaze as though she saw her for the first time kissed her heartily and was gone take care of yourself lucilla cried honora to the empty air End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of transition this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org transition by emma francis brooke chapter eighteen lucilla found it horribly damp and cold and miserable in the short train journey she had to take her sensations in the omnibus drive from the station to bloomsbury were worse the rattle of the wheels over the stones made her head giddy and the jolting jarred her nerves then all alive with diseased sensitiveness as she was her fellow-passengers disgusted and sickened her a great german leaned across and bawled commonplaces into the ears of two long-suffering compatriots his pair of gesticulating fat and grimy hands spreading over their knees and under their very noses the spectacle offended lucilla i have become fastidious said she escaping with aching head and nerves from the rattle and bluster but the short walk 
that remained before she could reach the museum was an extremity of cold clinging evil the streets were wet and a remnant of fog too weak to descend and too feeble to escape hung in the overcharged atmosphere afflicting the body with chills and the spirit with untold depression lucilla walked on pressing her small foot down in the thin sea of mud undauntedly but her face was desperate arrived at the british museum she did not find in the reading desk the cure she expected the dictionary and the array of books failed to inspirit her of late a singular lethargy had sometimes oppressed her and a feeling of physical weakness and uneasiness hard to comprehend every now and then she shivered at last she concluded that the effort of study was for the moment useless and leaving her books she went to the refreshment room for a cup of hot coffee it was no use returning to her work immediately the power of concentration seeming to have left her and when she came out of the refreshment room she began to wander aimlessly about looking at one thing after another but with scant interest and poor attention at last she paused wearily under the pedestal of one of the nereids the galleries felt at once close and chilly everything was vault-like and no object had the power to catch her thought from its own preoccupation it returned now to the conversation with honora it was because honora has not got it in her to reject my advice that i talked as i did said she to herself but what would i not give to be able to speak effectually in the same strain to my own self and yet it was foolish random talk with a bit of good advice embedded in it what would honora make of it all i wonder what lies under her fine serenity does she perhaps love leslie littleton how she would support his life and transfix it she wandered round the room glancing cursorily at the sculptures and returned to the same spot she stood quite still close against the nereid who with bare foot and wind-filled garment seemed ready to rush past her yes continued lucilla to herself i would give a good deal to be able to tender such sane and obvious advice to my own mind with a chance of getting it accepted a whimsical smile altered the thin cheek for a moment but i'm fatally against my own self it is always something mystic sharp that speaks through me i have a goad in my own hand to turn against my own breast if i want to step aside for a moment something urges me on and i can't do it what significance there is in everything the one thing befalls us that can befall at that moment she turned her head with a restless movement the arch to the right of the mausoleum was she found occupied by a passing figure and when she saw it the crimson rushed into her cheek and her heart gave a sickening movement in her breast it was months since she had seen paul sheridan and that was he who had gone by the passing figure disappeared he was walking aimlessly as though infected by the day's depression presently he returned lucilla's eyes were still fixed on the open arch an incredible choking bitterness had assailed her at the sight of him she did not dream of running forward to accost him now her foot indeed seemed rooted to the ground and a presentiment of impending fate was the uppermost feeling of her mind but this time he saw her raised his hat and advanced smiling my successful friend said lucilla holding out her hand with a dry air paul's cheek coloured sensitively he was eagerly glad to see her again he had so sincere a feeling of friendship for the girl and had missed her at every turn of his life her late attitude towards himself and others was to him a painful mystery his information concerning her being of the scantiest 
instinctively he felt himself to be somehow an offender but he had not the least idea of the reason and his single object was to soothe and conciliate it is a very long time since we met said he are you very busy reading i was just taking an off quarter of an hour from my desk i did not see you in the reading-room said she nor i you perhaps we were both too industrious but won't you come along now and look at greek vases with me i should prefer a more unsophisticated pottery said she with the same dry smile all right let us visit primitive man he returned glad of as much concession as was implied in her consent to accompany him having secured so much he led the way in the rapid insistent manner natural to him his movements contrasted strongly with the soft weary step of the girlish figure that followed near him lucilla looked slimmer and more feminine than ever her face tinted and altered by his presence was turned towards him reluctantly and her eyes followed every movement of his with a curious and notable expression there was prescience in her look and it lent momentary majesty to features that were chiselled for tenderer emotions turning round suddenly to speak to her he caught the import of her glance took a step back and walked beside her he had been turning over in his mind the wisdom of questioning her and now suddenly decided you have not been amongst us lately said he you have avoided us have i said lucilla wearily i think you have said he i hope there has not been any special cause i have missed you i should be sorry if you left us would you paul the voice that floated from her lips was soft and weary like the twitter of a winter bird when snows are on the ground and berries scarce indeed i should said he with friendly heartiness lately he added in a gentler tone i missed your congratulations lucilla that was the signal for a tumult of the brain she felt her own thoughts shake before her were there not enough then asked she with cold self-restraint why should i add mine to such a common heap his face fell a little at her tone and reply oh never mind he returned cheerily i dare say you did not think the occasion worth while after all my return to parliament is a matter of very relative importance only i missed you the heart was too kind to allow itself to be hurt and you yourself were glad she asked oh very it will take up an enormous amount of time but there was hardly anything that seemed to me so useful to do besides i like it and you sought it oh yes i put all i was into the election it's no use doing things by halves and then came praises yes i had fairly to be rescued by devoted friends from the hands of the enthusiastic electors paul was determined not to allow her cold manner to annoy or drive him away he was hurt but would not show it just so and you had no sense of nausea nausea why no what do you mean lucilla i meant to come out top if i could possibly compass it and when i did compass it of course i was glad that my fellows hurrahed and you do not distrust this success not particularly i am fully conscious of the limitations of our social knowledge still i wanted our programme to be everybody's programme the next thing is to get into parliament to push it the year has brought us on so fast said she twelve short months ago they were still throwing mud and stones at you now they bespatter you with flatteries i get my fair share of abuse still if that's a comfort to you lucilla he returned with a genial smile i tolerate the mud and i can survive the flattery they both just come in in the day's work my faith will not carry me over this era of praise what does that mean you are not going back on socialism surely i lucilla started indeed no it is not i who am going back i hope said paul with the first hint of irritation in his voice that you are not going to accuse me of doing so i suppose it is the method we have differed about that before 
they went on in silence side by side until they reached the potteries of early man here they paused sheridan taking occasion to glance at his companion was suddenly struck by ruth at the pallor and sadness of the young face beside him he was in two minds whether to relinquish the conversation or to continue it in his perplexity he stood for a moment with downcast eyes passing his hand over his moustache as was his wont in moments of indecision after all what had this slight creature to do with the rough struggle which formed so large a portion of his life had he not better leave her with some mere gentle assurance of undiminished kindliness and friendship rather than seek to carry her through an argument that he suspected was too harsh for her he did not decide upon his action when he looked up she was staring absently at the cases he came near the thought of his own annoyance absolutely extinguished and regarded her with a very kindly light in his eyes and lucilla stood still seeing across the cases and the stony remains of an age long dead the burning and diminished future of her dreams won't you look at these things said he and forget my delinquencies i believe i could tell you something about them i am afraid i am a very imperfect person but won't you forget that and give me what credit is my due remember he added in a still more musical voice that i am not able am not able to clothe myself with an ideal that is not mine but yours will you not trust me it is painful to me to be distrusted by a friend one expects it from a stranger or a foe but not from a friend lucilla her own name uttered in that tone struck her dumb she could not upbraid him but her mind was wide awake to her own meaning and her heart burnt sickened and saddened she felt acutely the divergence between them apparently he had never understood her certainly he was not understanding her now but then did she understand him supposing after all we are strangers she thought a great tremor went through her and she looked towards him with a new light in her eyes in which something of fear commingled sheridan catching the look returned it with one of inquiry afterwards he remembered and it was a lifelong memory that expression in her pale set face the meeting of their eyes startled her again into speech his own look became more wistful tenderer i cannot help it she exclaimed i don't think that it is personal it is that i distrust this phase it seems to me we must be fatally wrong to have reached it that is surely unreasonable he replied some part of what we set ourselves to bring about has come or is coming to pass we ought to congratulate ourselves hesitation just now would be a poor sort of tribute to our faith lucilla threw out her hands with an expressive gesture it has all been done through compromise not the very least said he it has been done through educating people in particular social notions until they came to accept them to me it is as though we had passed into the enemy's citadel by the simple process of selling our standard sheridan flushed angrily he was deeply hurt but he mastered himself out of consideration for her what would you have me do other than i have done said he quietly lucilla turned drawing herself up tensely and wearing in her eye a fierce bright spark do she cried i want you to come out of society and not be in it at all above all i want you to defy the miserable hypocrisy of our representative government i cannot bear you to take part in it you paul you ought to be the last to have entered that degrading place of shams which we call our parliament you should have remained outside to speak truths to them like swords sheridan's anger melted at once before the girl's passion his manner perceptibly mildened and he looked down on the ground with a musing smile all this what i ought to do said he what is it that i do you have taken their methods and used them to your own ends the girl's figure still quivered from the intensity of the flame that burned within paul threw back his head with a light laugh just so said he to the service of the social idea rather and what can i do better than that i am in the world for the purpose 
and i think i shall make some shift to talk swords as you call it inside the walls of parliament as well as outside but i want you she began you want me to be very heroic and very foolish and very rash he looked at her kindly and the blood mounted to her cheek a momentary perplexity came into her eyes don't you see he pursued seeing his advantage that you give away your own case what i have done is precisely what i ought to do he is a bad soldier who betrays his own cause out of rashness but come on i want to show you the bone scratchings the girl bent and broke for a moment under the influence of the strong man oh paul she cried with a desperate catch in her voice as they walked on and turning to him out of old blind habit for consolation and help i was so happy in the old days so happy and so certain in the days i mean when we used to have tea in my rooms and when we made conspiracies against society and everybody despised us a hint of something childlike and small reached him through her voice an answering flash came into his face it changed again and softened then he pressed nearer turning his tones to a very gentle key and when we despised everybody hey eh? i'm afraid we have had to learn wisdom since but there was a good deal of fun in it wasn't there and we were all very fiery and young and ignorant it was a golden time i allow but we cannot keep such things lucilla it would not be right even to try i'm afraid it is a stern lesson but we have got to pass on and to accept graver responsibilities with older years if i only could believe if i only could believe the words were almost whispered sheridan who was himself painfully impressed with the sense of limitation in the available amount of knowledge of the general social structure could not but feel this search after a short cut to social redemption to be a miserable craze come said he once more clearing his face to kindly effort it isn't as bad as all that why should you try to believe anything now i'll try to explain don't you see that the difference between you and me is the difference between the revolutionary and democratic spirit is it said lucilla forlornly yes i take into practical consideration existing surroundings and you don't it seems to me we have altogether changed we have not we always mingled sanity with our biggest dreams an extreme revolutionist looks on a perfect knowledge of what must be done to put the world right as existing side by side with intolerable conditions but such coexistence is impossible part of the evil condition is our ignorance here and there we see a little bit that obviously may be done when we've done that our little bit we shall be in a better position for fresh aspiration and fresh action because we shall know more oh said lucilla it is wintry days with me now you talk of aspiration it is lost in compromise sheridan frowned slightly he was himself too constant and faithful in his attachments not to be susceptible under the unjust blame of a friend he had hardly the heart for the moment to argue any more the energy died out of his voice and the light from his eyes suddenly he felt hopeless of any genuine understanding i really think i am pretty plain-spoken said he rubbing his hand nervously over the glass case in which the unsophisticated pottery lay unnoticed while lucilla's deep eyes gazed at passionate visions after all when there is only one way the wise thing is to take it no she stamped her foot carve a new way well i must leave that to you lucilla you always have overrated me a troubled colour crept into his cheek now perhaps you are falling into the other kind of injustice i am certainly not a poet you perhaps would claim to be able to see the whole tree of social progress at once frankly to me the tree runs out of sight into the clouds all i can do is to see a little bit of progress at a time and to try and find the practical ways in which it may be realised you seemed to mean so much more than that 
i really do not follow you he returned in still gentle and carefully restrained tones you appear to ask me to act as though things were as they are not and to blame me for not being in a world that does not exist i find facts are so and so i perceive that certain changes have come about that they are here and mean to stay for the present i must adapt my theory of action to the things which are as i perceive them to be is that all is there nothing more not ultimately all of course but for the present yes we must not forget organic continuity i think we have an effect to deal with the mass of average men and not with exceptional units the method i select is one that tells on the present democratic average my ultimate aim is to raise that average to make the average man all round a higher being than he at present is but the lever i use must be an effectual one it is no use trying something impossible oh are there no ideals any more if you want me to find ideals amongst impossibilities frankly i cannot waste my time about it i must seek my expediencies my actions my moralities amongst sturdy facts still o'er the earth hastes opportunity seeking the hardy soul that seeks for her i cannot impose an ideal upon facts what i have to do is to find out what ideal these facts are trying to compel me to you will jump with the cat sheridan moved his head angrily if you describe in that way a piece of obvious sanity said he cut to the heart the impatient movement of his fingers over the glass marked the strain on his forbearance i call you to go on cried the girl in a fire of indignation there was something in her feeling at that moment ruthless remorseless paul left the case over which they had bent without seeing its contents and walked forward through the gallery lucilla following as before both faces were strangely disturbed distrait preoccupied lucilla no longer gazed at him but straight before her through a mist paul stung by the sense of injustice where he least had occasion to expect it heartily wished the conversation had never been begun even now however a sense of the girl's trouble and weakness left the uppermost feeling one of a sincere desire to help and console for his regret at the division of opinion between them was acute and perennial it led him to tune his voice to a tone of studied gentleness to force back a smile to his harassed face and to make one more effort i really think you want said he to break society to pieces in your wrath now i don't in the least desire to do that i admit its misery and sickness as much as you do but i want to try and discover what is the disease so that it may cure itself my faith that society can do this is simply invincible oh she threw her hands out again with that expressive gesture you talk of faith you have let faith in method take the place of faith in principle it seems to me lucilla that the failure in faith is yours an all-or-nothing business like ibsen's brand is fatal because it is false never say that i fail in faith cried lucilla whose burning belief in the impossible was her greatest misfortune she spoke with heartfelt earnestness and a breaking voice very well lucilla said paul very quietly i will not say it i will not be as hard on you as you are on me she could not reply her breast was heavy with suspended sobs hard on him and he not hard on her the world was full of some great cloud of confusion and her own words bitterly returned to her memory now as cruel missiles that had fallen she knew not how or why but which had certainly failed to convey her meaning it was no use speaking any more speech was a mere rending of each spirit with theories and their friendship lay like a torn thing between them how was it that the little rift in the lute had widened to this ruined music paul's heart was full of ruth at what had happened he would have given much to erase the impression from his own mind and from hers but he was conscious that every reach he had made across this chasm of divergent opinion to the reality of friendship beyond had been repulsed by the girl and that with bitter words 
he looked pale and worried and kept raising his hand nervously to his moustache he found it hard to bear the implied blame from lucilla he regretted her attitude missed her sympathy and disliked her discouragement and all the time it chafed him to be unable to detect whence the difference arose neither was responsible and neither was to blame phases of mind and character are not synchronous even between friends and the people who jostle each other in the street are not of the same hour or century this makes the difficulty and delicacy in human intercourse the pain of it and the sweetness of forbearance and forgiveness or the bitterness of anger and revenge but after all to sheridan when the most was said the incident was but one in the day a thousand calls would presently obliterate it from his mind as they neared the entrance to the bus gallery he shook off the depression which had seized him and turned to lucilla with rather a chillily bright air lucilla to whom on the contrary every one of his words had fallen like a never lifting pall stopped short feeling that the interview was at an end paul drew out his watch and glanced at it they stood under the five-legged assyrian bull whose stony brutality might well have represented to one at least of the pair the barbarity of circumstance besides divergence of opinion the barrier of sex was between them lucilla was too preoccupied to feel it the better instructed man was sharply conscious of it for the moment since all naturalness and spontaneity and coincidence of thought had passed out of their friendship nothing remained but for him to leave her alone he was not her lover the only right he had in her was the right that came from her spontaneous allegiance that gone he was not in a position to attempt a conquest i must be off he said holding out his hand to bid her adieu his face pale and full of ruth and compunction i am due at an appointment in less than a quarter of an hour good-bye i am sincerely sorry we have differed try and do as much justice to me as you can i shall always think well of you but don't expect too much of me i am nothing after all but a strong earth man not the least of an angel you know adieu au revoir he held her hand warmly for a second his eyes asking pardon the while hers did not grant it and then he turned away lucilla looked after him in dumb agony to her the termination of the interview had terrible significance for she knew that it had pushed her over the brink. End of chapter 18